All righty, good afternoon. I'm Donovan Richards from the 31st District in Queens, and I'm the chair of the Committee, committee on Public Safety. Uh, today we're joined by Council Members Lanceman, Valone, Cabrera, and Rodriguez. And today we are hearing introduction number 1847 in relation to individualized responses to violent to violent hate crimes. The bill requires an individualized response to every allegation of a hate crime. It requires the Office of for the Prevention of Hate Crimes to notify elected officials and the affected community within 24 hours of determining that a violent hate crime has occurred. This bill is about making sure that during these frightening times, our government is doing all it can and all it should to stem the rise of hate crimes and hate speech across the country and to reassure its citizens about our city's commitment to diversity and inclusion. It's about making sure communities know that our law enforcement agencies treat hate crimes as seriously as they should. Essentially, it is about communication. We last held a hearing on hate crimes in November of 2018, and we heard the legislation that led to the creation of the Office for, for the Prevention of Hate Crimes. The bill passed in January, and for the last year, the administration has been working to get OPHC off the ground. While this is not an oversight hearing, I do want to give OPHC an opportunity to discuss what steps they have taken to begin the process of setting up a coordinated system for responding to hate crimes. And I do expect to hear that the office's staffing and resources are sufficient to satisfy an unfortunately growing demand for their work. I'm also looking forward to hearing from the NYPD if anything has changed in the last year and a half about how they view these crimes and how their response to affected communities has changed as the number of hate crimes has increased. But I want to make it clear that we're not here to say that either of the agencies before me have been underperforming. This effort has been truly collaborative from the beginning and it must continue to be in order to be successful. That collaboration includes the administration and the council, but most importantly, it has to include the community organizations and community members who are at the core of our efforts. We at the council believe that this bill provides the necessary guidance to OPHC while providing their discretion to react to facts on the ground, adapt to future developments, and, and consider the particular needs of victims and communities. With that said, I look forward to hearing your testimony on the bill. I don't see the lead sponsor, Mark Traeger, here today. Uh, and before I let you begin, uh, we just want to uh, pause for a second to, um, uh, to thank the NYPD for all the work that they do and also to pay homage to the department um, during this complicated and difficult time where obviously two officers were shot yesterday. Our prayers are with those officers and we pray that they make a full recovery and I want you to know that this council, uh, while we may differ on issues, will always stand with the NYPD uh, and wanted to just reassure you that you have our support. So with that being said, uh, you may begin. Well, thank you. Before, before the director begins, we just want to thank you for your thoughts. Uh, thank members of the Bronx delegation for showing up at the hospital, uh, the public advocate, and uh, all of the, the borough president, all of the elected leaders. Thank you. And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? That being said, you may begin. I'm new at this. Good afternoon, Chair Richards. And welcome to your first hearing. Thank you so much. Be Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Lauder. I'm the Executive Director of the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes. And on behalf of the office, which is a unit in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we thank you for this opportunity to testify regarding 1847-2020 relating to the response to violent hate crimes. Let me begin by saying that hate has no place in New York City, a city celebrated for its diversity. And no New Yorker should ever feel targeted or unsafe because of their race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. I want to thank the Council for its leadership in creating the OPHC and for your input and support since its inception. While, of course, it is expected that our elected leaders will condemn hate crimes after they occur, you have taken 
steps and actions to do something even greater. You have enabled a tangible effort that will prevent hate from taking hold in the first place. Our city's holistic approach is the first of its kind in the country, and I can share that it has received very positive support, not just from New Yorkers, but from across the nation and indeed from around the world. Many are looking to this initiative as a model to address the disturbing widespread rise in hate incidents. At this time last year, as you just noted, Chairman, the, city, the New York City Council passed legislation to create an office for the prevention of hate crimes, the very legislation that's under consideration for amendment today. That legislation provided that the new office should be open by November. Mayor de Blasio, concerned about the continuing rise in hate crimes, escalated the launching of the office, and my, my appointment was announced on September 3rd. I'm pleased to report that in just five short months, we have accomplished much, including completing the administrative work of opening a new office, and we are now fully staffed with seven full-time employees. One of my priorities over these first months has been to engage deeply with different communities across the city, particularly those who are vulnerable to bias incidents and hate crimes. I've spoken at over 50 meetings in all five boroughs and have solicited input from dozens of leaders of religious, education, and community-based organizations, as well as academic institutions and think tanks. This has helped me identify areas where, government, where city government could take a more active role, convening stakeholders and augmenting and innovating new tools. In these meetings and town halls, I have heard the voices of concern, of frustration, of fear, but also of optimism, energy, and resolve to engage in what many of us see not just as the fight against hate, but the fight for the soul of civility and the right to respect. These first months have necessitated particular attention to the Jewish community because of the increase in hate crimes motivated by anti-Semitism, particularly targeting the religious Jewish communities in Brooklyn and in the wake of the horrific attacks in the neighboring Jewish communities in Jersey City and in Muncie. At the same time, the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes has been dedicated to addressing the unique issues and concerns of other communities that are vulnerable to bias incidents. The LGBTQ community experienced the second highest increase in hate crimes last year, including violent assaults against trans women. And we have been at their side speaking out and working with them to address strategies to combat this disturbing trend. We have engaged with leaders in the Muslim, Sikh, Asian, Hispanic, black, immigrant, as well as LGBT communities who report that their constituents too are experiencing an upsurge in bias-motivated incidents and hate crimes, yet most of these incidents are going unreported. One of the goals of the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes to address this problem of underreporting, not only so that we can show support and get help for victims, but also we can fully understand the scope of the problem and recommend strategies and resources to deal with it. Much of this work is being done through our management of the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative, which City Council funded through discretionary grants. Participating organizations include the Arab American Association of New York, the Center for Law and Social Justice at Medgar Evers, DSIS Rising Up and Moving, Center for Anti-Violence Education, Project Witness, New York Anti-Violence Project, New York Immigration Coalition, United Jewish Organizations of Williamsburg, Jewish Children's Museum. We have been overseeing those contracts and convening the full cohort of 15 participating organizations. With council support, our office has empowered and enabled them to share their challenges, their best practices, and with the others who are engaged in these kinds of grassroots efforts. As part of our mandate under the legislation to perform a coordinating role for the city, the OPHC has also formed an interagency committee for the prevention of hate crimes, and we have convened 11 city agencies and the city's five district attorney offices, all of whom are stakeholders in preventing and addressing hate violence. By bringing them together with an intentional focus on addressing hate crimes, the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes is breaking down silos and engaging educators, first responders, victim service providers, restorative justice advocates, and other subject matter experts. Interagency committee representatives are sharing information about their current programs, resources, best practices, and engaging together in creative thinking and recommendations that will have long-term impact. 
I have dedicated almost three decades of my civil rights and human relations career to combating stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination, hate, and extremism at the state, national, and global le levels. I'm gratified that I can now focus my skills and expertise to benefit New York City. What I have shared with city agencies, community organizations, elected officials, media, and others is that there is not one way to fight hate. It requires a multi-pronged approach. And so I have set forth a three-pillar strategy for the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes, and we're focused on education, community relations, and law enforcement. First, I'll speak about education. I'm pleased to report that we are already making significant progress with respect to our education mandate. In December, we partnered with the Department of Education to create resources on promoting respect and addressing hate crimes. And Chancellor Carranza sent these resources to over 150,000 educators in the system, urging them to have conversations with their students about the rise in hate crimes and making it clear that anti-Semitism, racism, and all forms of hate and bigotry will not be tolerated in our school system. We also help facilitate a partnership between the Department of Education and the Museum of Jewish Heritage to provide an opportunity for 14,000 students from Brooklyn to tour the museum's exhibit, which, which is called Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. And, are, and they're providing families of students 12 and over to receive free tickets to the museum as well. This initiative will educate students and their families about the consequences of hate through powerful, message, through powerful images and survivor stories. We've also been working with the DOE to develop a new curriculum resource on hate crimes, which will be introduced and available to teachers citywide in the coming academic school year. Community relations. With respect to community relations, in addition to our work with the, H, the HVPI, the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative, at the end of December, the mayor announced a new initiative, the formation of neighborhood safety coalitions. These coalitions, consisting of leaders from community-based organizations, houses of worship, civic associations, tenant associations, community boards, businesses, and community school districts, will address neighborhood safety issues with an intentional focus on preventative measures and programs that will have long-term impact. Neighbors will come together to break down stereotypes and build healthy relationships that fo foster safety and social cohesion. Last week, the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes hosted a joint inaugural meeting of the three coalitions. They're made up of leaders from Greater Borough Park area, Crown Heights, and Williamsburg Bedsty communities. The theme of Core Values NYC guides their efforts to create action plans and programs with CORE, C-O-R-E, an acronym standing for Community of Respect for Everyone. Last week, I also had the privilege to participate in a remarkable program that was organized by Community School District 14, Superintendent Alicia Winicki in Williamsburg. Rabbi David Niederman of the United Jewish Organizations and I engaged in a thoughtful, powerful discussion with student leaders and then a school walk within superintendent, principal, CEC members, student advisors, and students from the neighborhood schools. This program has also been done successfully by Rabbi Ellie Cohen from the Crown Heights Jewish Community Council in partnership with Jeffrey Davis, director of Stop Violence Foundation. We're looking now to expand this model across the neighborhood safety coalition communities with the enthusiastic, resport, with enthusiastic support of community school district superintendents District 17 in Crown Heights and District 20 in Borough Park, who are both members of their respective neighborhood safety coalitions. To further advance community education, the office is overseeing the development of new advertising and social media campaigns to confront prejudice, encourage mutual respect, and empower anyone who is a victim of a hate crime to come forward and report it. Last but not least, law enforcement. I am proud to sit here alongside the NYPD, who have been vital partners, not just in responding to hate crimes, but in seeking ways to address preventative solutions. Commissioner Shea's presence at so many of the community meetings and the tone that he has set for the whole department to take seriously and address the increase in hate crimes has been exemplary. We believe his commitment to community policing, initiatives focused on youth, as well as the new intelligence unit to address racially and ethnically motivated extremism, are all critically important measures. 
We also were extremely pleased to see the Commissioner's positive response to the Council's request to include hate crime statistics in CompStat, which we believe is a significant step in heightening awareness and an improving response to hate violence. I also want to commend and thank Deputy Inspector Mark Molinari, who heads up the New York Police Department's Hate Crime Task Force, as he has been especially helpful in providing guidance and partnership to the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes as we have gotten off the ground. With respect to the proposed amendments, when a hate crime is committed, there is an urgent desire, particularly among those who share the victim's identity, to know what has happened, what steps are being taken to respond, and what the outcomes will be. Our elected officials are also eager for information about hate crime incidents so they can better respond to the inquiries and needs of their constituents. The Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes recognizes the importance of this, quote, need to know embodied in this proposed amendment and supports the intent of these amendments. We are currently exploring effective, responsible methods of notification that preserve the integrity of an investigation and at the same time provide assurance to all parties that an incident is being handled appropriately. We want to thank the committee again for convening this hearing today and to express our appreciation for the tremendous support demonstrated by leaders at every level of government and by organizations and individuals all over our city. We support the goals of this amendment and we are committed to working with the Council on how to operationalize this bill and uplift communities so that all New Yorkers and visitors feel welcome and safe. Thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions. And we're joined by Council Members Gibson, Cohen, Adams, Powers, Deutsch. All right, thank you. And um, I guess I'll start off with the NYPD. Uh, can you speak to how does the department tr uh, track the type of hate crimes being committed? And of the reported hate crimes in 2019, can you provide a breakdown um, of the type of hate crimes? Good afternoon, Chief Mike LaPetri, Chief of Crime Control Strategies. So as far as uh, tracking uh, hate crimes, uh, when, a, uh, when a crime is, uh, is alleged, a complaint report is, is taken, just like you know, any crime would be misdemeanors, felonies, UCR. Uh, crimes. When a hate crime uh, is alleged, the investigation starts with the patrol officer, but then the captain or above, an executive, has to respond to every suspected hate crime. Uh, he does, he or she does a preliminary investigation. A unusual occurrence report is then uh, written by the captain or above. The complaint report uh, will, will be documented as a suspected hate crime. That will then uh, trigger a notification to our hate crimes unit, and then ultimately hate crimes will make the final determination if that is in fact a, uh, a hate crime. As far as statistics, in 2019, uh, we did see an increase in hate crime uh, with 428 complaints versus 356 for an increase of 20% or in a raw number increase of 72. Those 428 complaints were driven by anti-Semitic motivation with 234 compared to 186. So that was an increase of 48, a raw number increase of 48 or 26% and that accounted for 55% of all our hate crimes. When you drill down to the anti-Semitic hate crimes of the 234, approximately 77% of the 234 were property related or 181 crimes. And if you look at those 181 crimes, the property crimes, approximately half of those were, were swastika motivated. And then out of the um can you just break down also the 186? I'm sorry, the- uh, um, So 234, the 234 were anti-Semitic. Sure, I, I could break it down, Okay. Uh, no, mm -hmm. no problem. So uh, 96, 96 were aggravated harassment one. So that's your swastika. So approximately 90 out of your 96 aggravated harassment ones were motivated by a swastika, okay? Aggravated harassment two, that also saw an increase uh, of, uh, of 16, so aggravated harassment one 
and aggravated harassment two drove your anti-Semitic increase, okay. right? So again, anti-Semitic rose by 48 crimes, aggravated harassment one and aggravated harassment two increased by 55. So there's your increase. And again, the large percentage of that is uh, swastika motivated. When you look at the physical assaults as, as far as anti-Semitic motivation, they were actually down. We, we, had 14, we had 14 victims compared to 15. Uh, robberies also went down for anti-Semitic motivation, uh, two versus four. Uh, the, the, the increase that we saw when it came to uh, physical contact, specifically uh, grand larcenies did rise, four versus one, and that could be uh, property, you know, usually it's, it's property on somebody that, that somebody would take. So largely increased by swastikas. Okay. Uh, and I want to hop back over to OPHS. Uh, so uh, what is the Office of Hate Crime Prevention's current headcount? Uh, we are at seven. Seven staff members. Mm -hmm. And do you believe the staffing level is sufficient to respond appropriately to, um, as we saw, uh, 428 hate crimes last year? Right. So what's important to note, Chairman, is that even though we have a, a dedicated staff of seven, we are embedded in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. So I'm sitting here with General Counsel Susan Summer um, from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, we have a full panoply of policy experts, communication, research folks who are also supporting this office most immediately. But when I look at the resources and the whole way that I've structured this office, it's really to engage as I said, 11 city agencies. So I'm sitting with the Department of Education. I'm sitting with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We're sitting with NYPD. We are all partners, um, and I see that as some of the resources. When I look at all of you up here as city councilmen, you are partners in this work, particularly in the community relations aspect of what we're doing. In order for us to really get uh, headway in preventing hate crimes, it needs to be a full effort with all New Yorkers involved. So I'm confident that the resources right now um, are sufficient to get us to the next level. Thank you. And let's just speak, uh, Councilmember Miller joined us as well. Um, uh, can you just go through, so year to date, compare this January to last January on hate crimes? Have we seen an uptick or where are we at? Uh, 2020? Yeah. Yes, I have the numbers. Okay. So we're actually down. Uh, two hate crimes. Uh, this is as of February 9th, so from 1-1 one, one to February 9th of 2020 to 2019, we're actually down two hate crimes, 43 versus 45. As far as looking at the anti-Semitic, anti which obviously drove uh, last year's increase, we're actually down two anti-Semitic motivated crimes, 27 versus 29. 27 versus 29, and what are the other categories? Uh, we have uh, anti-black is actually uh, increased this year, nine versus three. Gender is two versus one. Sexual orientation is, is two versus four. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, one for religion and one for uh, white. Okay. And OPHC, can you just go through what does true coordination look like after a violent hate crime with the NYPD? Are right. you out there with them, or can you just walk me through what would be your role? Right, so the hate crime task force that we work closely with, they, that's the investigative body. Um, what we work on now is, as I mentioned, Deputy Inspector Molinari will usually give me a heads up about uh, an incident that has occurred so that we can then reach out to uh, organizations that support the community that may have been attacked. Um, this is one of the, the purposes of this bill is to improve that communication system. Um, to be quite honest with you, in, in these days of social media, we're often becoming aware of these incidents by the victims and by witnesses uh, even before the incidents have been reported to NYPD. So some of it is just getting in those circles of knowing who's reporting and um, being able to respond and let people know that the city is taking it seriously investing in any, as a hate crime, if, that, if that's appropriate, and then providing response, uh, both from the communities, but also victim response, if necessary. And you support intro 1847? 
or if there needed to be any changes, what would you suggest? Yeah, I think there are probably some operational tweaks. The requirement of 24 hours, I think we would like to take a closer look at that. There's also some language about affected communities that I think needs clearer definition. Um, so we're happy to work with council to clarify some of those provisions and tighten them up. And then you said, uh, t so what is the issue with notifying communities in 24 hours? So some of it is you, the, to do hate crime uh, detection um, right, it needs a very careful evaluation. Um, you heard uh, the chief describe uh, the command staff that is involved with NYPD. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time. Um, they can deem it a hate crime, but it actually takes a little bit more investigative and with the DA's office getting involved as well to make sure that this was motivated by bias against a, uh, the characteristics that specified in the legislation. So um, sometimes the, the worst case is to jump to conclusions, which can cause a whole nother level of community fear. Um, and then we find out after the fact that it in fact was not a hate crime. So I just, I just think we need to be prudent in terms of how we can um, have a requirement in terms of the timeliness of reporting, make sure people are in the loop, but do it right. And let's go back to NYPD quickly. So I know um, John Miller announced a, a new unit, um, racially and ethically motivated extremism unit. Uh, what is the coordination like, if there's any, with you and OPHC? Um, what are their staffing levels? What role are they playing? I guess at this moment in combating hate crimes. So they, um, the Remy unit has approximately uh, a head count of 25. Uh, I think the way, the best way to look at it is um, we, we have the hate crimes task force which investigates all um, hate crimes in the, in the city. Hate crimes task force is the largest hate crimes uh, investigative unit, I believe, in the country. Uh, How many people in that unit? Uh, I think that's 25, 25. Um, then what we did was created the Remy unit, and the focus there is m less of a reactive investigating a crime when it actually happens and more of a proactive where they're taking a look and doing investigations, taking a look at uh, um, organizations, groups, individuals that are uh, making calls to violence based on hate and um, getting ahead of it, getting ahead of the crime before it becomes a crime, getting ahead of the situation. So uh, again, we coordinate it within the department and then as a department we coordinate with, um, with uh, uh, Director Ladder and um, and try to uh, get ahead of the problem where we can investigate the crimes when they actually occur. All right, I'm gonna go to my colleagues for question. And I just wanna circle back. You said, um, so uh, hate crimes against black people have increased. What has been the basis of those hate crimes? Have they been violent or can you just speak to what? As far as, as the specific crimes uh, this year uh, against uh, African Americans, uh, aggravated harassment, account for three out of those, I'm sorry, so aggravated harassment one, which, uh, and aggravated harassment two, account for six out of the nine crimes. There is two, um, so it's six out of nine, I could get you the other three. Uh, criminal mischief, so those are your nine. So uh, not specifically uh, against a person as far as an assault or anything like that. But again, we investigate uh, all these crimes very, very seriously. So we do see an uptake in uh, anti, uh, anti-black this year. Though last year we were down. Uh, uh, anti-black were down uh, seven, seven crimes last year, 37 versus 44. And speak to um, what percentage is violent opposed to nonviolent overall across the board? Okay, so overall across the Okay, board. and that's all hate crimes. Okay, so when I look at last year, when I look at your 428 crimes, uh, approximately 65% of that is property related. When you, when you, look, when you look at- uh, And property, property related means graffiti or- 
Correct. It could be criminal. It could be an egg thrown at a religious institution. It, it could be graffiti, a swastika, or it could be other graffiti. But, but that would be property related. So again, that's all of the hate crimes. Out of your 428, approximately 65% property related. When you look at your anti-Semitic 234, approximately 70% of those are property related. Um, and the other 35% is that, violent? Well, not, not I mean, oh, oh, oh. you know, not to, uh, you know, again, th these are victims. Um, as far as when you talk about y your physical assaults, so there's the simple misdemeanor assault, which is, you know, usually uh, a strike where you get an injury, uh, and the assault to a uh, little bit more, you know, more serious. Both of those crimes combined last year were down. 75 victims versus 79. When you look at your robbery motivated hate crimes last year, uh, also down, eight versus 15. So the, the spike in hate crimes last year was driven by swastikas, by anti-Semitism, uh, and again, motivated by swastikas. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to my colleagues now, uh, Lanceman Adams Gibson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, first, let me publicly thank all of you uh, for what I uh, believe has been a swift and comprehensive and sincere, sincere uh, response to the spike in anti-Semitic incidents uh, that occurred in the last couple of months. Um, we have seen each other at countless meetings and forums and rallies, um, and all of that is meaningful and um, you know, I'm very satisfied and, and very pleased that the city, whether it's the police department, Mach J, um, your new office, uh, is taking this crisis seriously. And of course, not just for the Jewish community, but for every community in New York City that's experiencing uh, these horrendous hate crimes. I just want to ask you specifically about the, the bill, because as I understand it, there's, there's really two parts to it. One is um, an individualized response to all alleged violent hate crimes. Um, I know the chairman had asked you about the bill, but I want to ask you in particular, what objection do you have or what concerns do you have, if any, in requiring the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes to provide an individualized response to all alleged violent hate crimes? That one I have no objection to. Okay. I think every, every hate crime requires an individualized response. Um, it attack, as I said earlier, it attacks the person's identity and then the response in the community. So um, I, I have no problem with that language. What, what would it, I only ask because, yeah. and this is not a criticism, okay. you hadn't, I don't believe you had mentioned it in your testimony regarding regarding the bill, so I just mm -hmm. wanted some clarification. In, in your mind, um, what would an individualized response look like, for example, where, mm -hmm. and, the, and the bill is limited to acts of violence, violence yeah. where um, somebody is uh, um, uh, punched on a, on a subway station, or a woman has her hijab ripped off her head walking down the street. What would an individualized response look like? Well, so the response needs to come from various levels. One, it c clearly is from response from NYPD and the Hate Crime Task Force being um, culturally sensitive to how to respond to that individual that um, was the victim. Um, so, you know, that training uh, officer, responding officers is critically important, and that's part of why we're so thrilled with the ComStat change, because we believe it will lead to heightened um, education for patrol officers. Then there's the community response. So if, if it, uh, in your example, if it is a Muslim woman, we would be reaching out to uh, some of the Muslim organizations that have expertise in dealing with hate violence um, and make sure to involve them in the response. Um, then the next level is, is clearly you want others to stand up, right? So reaching out to others 
who are not part of the Muslim community to say this happened and we want you to be there for the Muslim community to assure them that this incident is being taken seriously and condemned by all. So each one, there's, there are patterns to where they're similar, but the individualized response, I think, provides comfort to victims and their communities. Right. And so there's a sort of a, a menu of, of options or, or, or list of things that you do. Look, sure. when, when we've had incidents in, in my community, for example, an anti-Semitic incident or an anti-Muslim incident, um, there's a routine. Mm -hmm. I don't diminish what we right. do by calling it a routine, but there's, there's a routine. <clears throat> there's some public expression of uh, uh, disapprobation, right? right. There's uh, a gathering of people of different faiths to say that this swastika in this synagogue or this uh, assault on this Muslim, I have both an Orthodox and a Muslim community in my district of considerable size, is, is, is wrong. Um, you know, I think the reason your office was created is because beyond that, it's hard for the individual council member or elected official to really do anything meaningful in the school in terms of educating people or um, uh, any of the other steps that you that you mentioned. Right. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the, the sponsor of the bill, but I my support of the bill is based on a desire um, that there be a a professional, comprehensive, and thought out response to each incident in this case of, of violence, I wouldn't have a problem if the bill was even broader, um, but let's just leave it to violence, mm -hmm. that is, is more than just the couple of things that your local elected officials know to, know to do. Right. No, I, I would agree with that. And I welcome community's input on how to, to do that. Um, the, the consequences of violent acts require, I think, a very different level than the swastikas and whatnot. Each, each incident needs to be taken seriously, but when there is a violent act, um, then we have to involve, whether it's mental health professionals, whether it's um, you know, communities who can provide the victim support, all those elements need to go into this. So um, that's exactly the kind of thing that our office is looking to do and see where the best ways we can have an impact would be. So right. welcome then, your input. And then let me just ask you about yeah. The notification, the second part of the, yeah. the bill as I see it, which asks um, the office to provide relevant info to the affected community mm -hmm. within 24 hours and then notify the mayor, the speaker, the public advocate, the council members also within 25, 24 hours. I'm sure as you're mm -hmm. aware or could imagine if yeah. you weren't aware um, that when something happens in the community, council members, all the local elected officials start getting calls, texts, we see things on Twitter. Right. Um, it's unhelpful if we're in the dark, not just because um, we look like we're not on top of things, um, but there's some body of people in every district that relies on their local council member to get them uh, information. And all of the police precincts uh, have community affairs units. Um, in my district, I primarily have the 107th and the 103rd, a little bit of the 109th. When things happen, whether it's a hate crime or a shooting or something, you know, we're kind of relying on the, the local community affairs officer to send us a text or I might get a, a call from the, the CO. Um, I want to say it's ad hoc. Again, I don't say that as, as a criticism, um, but I don't believe that there's a formal notification mechanism. Incidents of hate crimes have a particular um, uh, ability or propensity to, 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 to spread, create fear. Um, get distorted through the, through, the, through the telephone game process that's amplified um, by social media. So, um, your view on establishing a regimented, official process for letting the office holders identified in this, in this legislation, and I would even go farther and say the community board, um, some kind of alert system. Alert. There's been an incident. Here's what we know. Right. And obviously there are things you don't want to tell us or can't tell us, but here's what we know. So that it is, it is, it is formal and it is um, uh, as thorough as it, as it can be. Your views on that? My views on that is I, I see that as a, 
a particularly helpful role that this office can play and look forward to working out the mechanics of doing that. One last question, just it's very simple. You may have uh, spoken to it already. What is the process, if there is one, whereby the police department lets you know that a thing has happened? Right. So far, the process has been that the hate crime task force, generally uh, Deputy Inspector Molinari, gets in touch with me very quickly, and we have conversations about the incident. Um, quite frankly, again, we have been notified some because it's been posted on social media. Sometimes I've been aware of stuff and have called him, and then he's uh, worked with his staff to, to get on it. So it's been uh, a, a pretty good system. I, I would say um, it's not regimented yet, but it's one of those things that now that I have seen how things play out um, that we can move from the ad hoc into a more regimented process, right. regimented. But I was gonna say, without in any way yeah. impugning the the, the No, 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 I mean, this has been a learning the, curve. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, so, the, the, um, the will of the, of the right. PD, mm -hmm. it does seem um, ad hoc. Yeah, I mean, we're the new guy in town, right? So, you know, we're all still, now it's, I think they're all getting used to and, and understanding the benefit of our office. Um, you know, when Deputy Inspector and Molinari and I have been out speaking in the communities, he has always stressed that his, the hate crime task force of NYPD is an investigative unit. Usually it's not the one speaking to community groups and educating them. And so they've been thrilled to have this new entity there who can do um, more of the outreach and community education piece. Um, and then in conjunction, now the communication piece. All right. Well, really, after the fact communication piece. Really, my last question to the to the PD: Is there any f formalization of the mechanism or process for 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 notifying notifying the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes when there has been an alleged hate crime? Is there any uh, patrol order being contemplated or anything? Any guidance that says here is when you will call or notify the office? Sure. So, I mean, we we always. I, I don't think our patrol guide is a couple of thousand pages, I believe. So we're always looking to formalize things. As the director said, it's a brand new office, and we've um, uh, we've centralized it to the extent that we have a hate crimes task force that designates, verifies that it is properly classified, meaning a, a crime classified as a hate crime. And that's centralized under the Hate Crimes Task Force, and they are the ones tasked with communicating with the director and working with, with her and her staff. And I think, uh, I think what you're saying is right. I mean, like anything else, as the relationship develops, we streamline it, we figure out efficiencies and better communication than what we even have now. Well, I, I urge you to get that in order as quickly as possible, and that it should include notifying the office at the earliest possible moment. Certainly not waiting until an incident has been officially designated as a hate crime, because the community is not waiting for that official designation. Sure, so uh, again, it's crimes that come in, we have to verify that it is a hate crime for, for the office of the director to be triggered, and uh, so that's what we do. We are doing it expeditiously. And again, we're open to formalizing the process. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lanceman. We're going to go to Adams, then Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here today. Appreciate your testimony thus far. Executive Director, I appreciate you getting the uh, color code notification today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up with uh, what my colleague, Councilmember Lanceman, uh, his line of questioning, I think, I think this is going to be more towards uh, geared uh, for the uh, PD also, just a couple of questions, because Councilmember Lanceman, I believe, was referencing back-end notification um, on the back-end and coordination. My question has to do with coordination more on the front-end as far as uh, systemic complaints like 311 and hate crime complaints coming into a system such as that. Is anyone taking a look at that, how to streamline those complaints and isolate them? So yes, we have. So w one of the things that, that we are going to be doing is we, we are going to be uh, upgrading our, our complaint reporting system, where now uh, when we enter the complaint uh, into the system, there will be a, a checkbox that will trigger a suspected or a motivated hate crime. So that would 
be a lot easier, say, for my office, Office of Crime Control Strategies, to now analyze better hate crimes. And, you know, that, what's your analysis? What's the plan? What's the results of your plan, right? M rapid deployment. Uh, so, so that is something that, that we are going to be doing. The other thing is that we are going to uh, have hate crimes captured on our ComStat sheet. So that will also be, that will be internally, but also externally in ComStat 2.0. So uh, the public and, uh, you know, uh, and also internally, we're able to, to capture it uh, more efficiently. And when you, ca when you capture data more efficiently, obviously the, the analysis is, is more efficient and then we move resources more efficient. That's good to hear. And finally, the, the, there is a uh, d disparity between uh, the number of complaints made and the number of arrests made. So what are some of the challenges that, um, that affect the arrests when it comes to hate crime complaints? So the, the, uh, the property-related um, uh, hate crimes, specifically the graffiti hate crimes, are difficult to investigate sometimes because we don't know how long that uh, graffiti has been there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we look, if we have video, we will go back, we will continue to go back and continue to go back if we, and then if we see something uh, that, you know, could, could be a piece of the puzzle to investigate that crime. So that, that is a challenge. When it's a crime against a person, uh, we, we tend to do better with those. You know, that, that is something that, you know, the crime is, is real time. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's reported usually uh, quickly. Um, so we, we, we do do better. And if you look at our percentage of arrests last year, approximately 25% uh, uh, was for property crimes and 75% was for crimes against people. So, you know, again, we take all, all crimes seriously. We take all, you know, we, we look at every crime as a victim. It's just the, the property crimes are more difficult to investigate. Thank you. I think you answered my part B also in there also. And just to let you know that um, this council is dedicated to doing whatever we can to uh, continue to um, disrupt and stop these incidents of hate in our city. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Thank you. Gibson Ballone, also joined uh, by Council Member Brenner. Thank you, Chair Richards and my colleagues who are here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and giving us an opportunity to really understand a little bit more in depth of what the Office to Prevent Hate Crimes uh, does do. Um, I was a part of this effort here in the council supporting my colleague um, and really all of the efforts that we've been trying to do as a council to provide support and really resources. So number one, glad to hear you're fully staffed. That's always a great thing. Um, I wanted to understand the partnership because it seems that this Office to Prevent Hate Crimes is really doing a lot of the grassroots work, mm -hmm. working on the ground, talking to various different organizations, both religious, faith-based community groups, and then the Hate Crimes Unit in the NYPD is a unit that actually does all of the actual investigative work. So in your testimony, when you talked about the process, I wanted to understand mm -hmm. what some of the metrics are by definition, because I think when you hear about some of the crimes that happen in New York City where they are more heightened through the media and get, getting a lot of attention. New Yorkers may think that it should be a hate crime, but when we go through the process, it's actually determined that it's not a hate crime. So what I would like to understand, and what are the metrics, and then on the ground, how is the office doing all of this engagement work with New Yorkers so that they understand what the office is geared to do and how you make that distinction. Because how we feel and reality are two different things. Yeah, thank you, that's a very good question, Council I experienced it, that's why. Yeah, you experienced <laughs> it. So there is a lot of misunderstanding about what hate crimes are and are not. Um, in New York State, hate crime laws are penalty enhancement statutes. So there has to be an underlying crime in order for them to kick in. Okay. What we see frequently, um, and in these times, uh, is that there's been a lot more name calling, I would call it, on the street. Like, people are experiencing, um, yeah. you know, anti-Semitic remarks being yelled at them, uh, racial epithets being yelled at them. Um, those 
our protected speech. This is the United wow. States. You have a right to be a bigot, wow. right? The impact on the individual can be pretty profound. I mean, right. that, but what we have to do is educate people about where that line is. Now, if somebody starts threatening the person, it can lead into, that may not reach even the uh, hate crime level, but it could be discriminatory harassment. And we have strong human rights laws in this state, and the, uh, the City Commission on Human Rights oversees those complaints as well. So when somebody calls 311, they can file a complaint for discriminatory harassment. So people need to be educated about it. We do not, well, many of these advocacy organizations do keep some statistics when they get complaints from community members, and that's exactly what we're trying to do through the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative is, is up their game in terms of keeping uh, statistics. So again, we can see the metrics and understand what's going on here and how can we address it. So um, we're working with them to do more statistical uh, reporting. Um, the, I'm trying to, your second question in terms of, um, I lost the my head. The hate crimes um, unit in the, the Yeah, the hate crime unit. So you're absolutely right. The hate crime unit is an investigative piece. That being said, we're working in partnership. So, um, you know, I think they have definitely welcomed um, <coughs> the groups that we're working with to, to provide the level. We're, I see us as almost a bridge between some of the communities that don't have the trust relationship with NYPD and looking for mechanisms that we can help them establish that trust. And what I've experienced in these five months is that there's a real willingness um, and openness on NYPD's part to engage in that, because um, they understand they're there to protect all communities and they want better relationships. So um, I, I believe that you will see that, that grow. One of the ironies of the metrics on hate crimes is going to be, you know, a year from now, when you ask me to testify <laughs> before this group, you're gonna wanna see statistics that say hate crimes went down. Uh, the paradox is gonna be that if we've actually done a really good job, those numbers might go up because people will have felt more comfortable reporting. Right? right. So, um, you know, metrics is a hard thing. When I look at the long-term metrics, it's, it's a hard thing to know. I mean, we are fully committed to impacting students, teaching them you know, respect principles, empathy principles, things that we believe will have long-term impact in reducing hate violence. But you're never gonna know how many kids we impacted that then did not go on to commit a crime, right? That's one right. of those things that's never gonna be provable. But it doesn't mean we have to lessen our commitment to doing that hard work. Okay, um, just two final questions as I turn it back to our chair. Um, I appreciate you recognizing and talking about the distinction, and I would urge both the Office to Prevent Hate Crimes and the Hate Crimes Unit on the ground at the local precinct area. When individuals go in and file complaints, they're usually told based on their scenario and what they've experienced that it is more aggravated assault and not an actual hate crime. That's why um, I wanna make sure that there's an emphasis on the definition because on the ground, mm -hmm. individuals are not being told that at the local precinct. So that's number one. Okay. And then number two, as you engage with uh, different organizations and obviously the rise in anti-Semitism and certainly the evilness, and I, I call it evilness because you have to really have an evilness in your heart to want to impose violence on others. And it's really sad that we've seen so yeah. much, particularly in the Jewish community. Um, but I also wanna acknowledge that there's also hate happening in many other communities too. It's just not always in the paper every day and people don't always feel um, comfortable coming forth. So I represent Bronx County. I represent a large concentration of residents from West Africa. Some are Muslim and some are not. And so I certainly would uh, like to see you working with organizations like Setin Yetu that works solely within the West African community that can help the office understand some of the challenges that we face and what we've been doing to work through that. And then as we talk about the neighborhood safety coalition communities, I wonder if that's almost the same as the safety summit meetings that the NCOs are offering. Sounds very similar. 
um, but certainly engaging the NCOs, community affairs officers, um, and, and the work you're doing with DOE is also critical. And so I want to add another component, and that is the Cure Violence and Crisis Management System. Many of those 22 different organizations are already working in our communities with young people and young adults. So just another layer of a resource for your office to engage, because they already have the relationships on the ground, and they can help you as you expand. Right. Thank you, Councilman. I welcome the opportunity to come meet people in your district and to sit down with you and get that input as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Valone Deutsch Miller. Okay. Deutsch. Go on. Oh, Deutsch is here. Okay. Deutsch is here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Um, so you mentioned before this 428 uh, hate crimes over, overall in 2019. How many of those through surveillance camera witnesses or, or some other source were led to an arrest? I'll let my colleagues in NYPD yeah. answer the specifics. So, so I don't have the total breakdown of, of if uh, we got probative video which led you know, mainly to that arrest. Uh, so I don't have it broken down like that. There's 181 arrests last year uh, for hate crimes. Obviously, uh, video is is a is a big part of of an investigation. Uh, interviewing witnesses, obviously, a big part of investigation. You know, the the uh, the hate crimes task force uh, investigators are experienced investigators that. Uh, Know, know how to do investigations, obviously. They have an expertise in uh, these types of crimes. So, you know, th there's a lot of factors uh, as far as how we, how we make an arrest. You know, it could, it could have started with the patrol officer, right? So a proper field investigation, uh, an arrest by patrol at the time of the incident. Then if, if we do not make the arrest, then the hate crimes uh, task force investigates it. And you know that's more of the video canvases, the witness canvases, the interviews of the complainant, the re-interviews of, of the complainant, and hopefully a culmination of an arrest. Thank you. Do you have the ages of um, a breakdown of the ages of those who were arrested from the 181? I do not have that. Okay. I just want to say for the record that um, uh, I met with the Brooklyn District Attorney a few weeks ago regarding the dispositions of all arrests, and of, uh, in particular the anti-Semitic hate crimes because we've seen an influx of those. And only a few of the, those arrests were actually going through the district attorney's office because um, in conjunction with raise the age, uh, the law that passed the raise the age, most of them go to, to juvenile court and they end up with the corporate counsel. And what I was told is also that most of those arrests, there, there is no, um, there's no charge of any crime. And it could go on for years, it could go on for one year, two years, or three years, where basically it doesn't even get closed out. So I just want to ask, I think it's very extremely important that, um, that um, the Office of Hate Crimes Prevention, that, that you're in touch with all five dis district attorneys, that when someone is under 18 and is identified, that they should be offered at least the education part when it's a property, when it's a property crime. So this way, they go through a mandated, um, they could be offered to go through a mandated uh, training, so this way they understand that whatever crime they committed um, against whichever, you know, uh, community, they should um, go through that sensitivity training and understand that they did something wrong, because um, otherwise these cases go on forever. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get a case, um, a disposition of a case from last year or two years ago. They have there was no information on that either. So I think it's important that we we work on this part because every time there's an arrest. Nothing happens after that. Right. We, don't, we don't get to know. The public doesn't get to hear anything about that. And the fact is because nothing is happening. Right. So, so I think that's extremely important. Um, secondly, I know that the police commissioner has been very vocal on, on bail reform. And you mentioned that uh, in 2020, the first, uh, the first month of 2020, um, hate crimes have gone down. 
and how many, um, the, what is the reason, uh, is, do you believe that the reason why um, there's a lower number of hate crimes because of the discovery part of bail reform, or is it actual factual that incidents of hate crimes went down? Yeah. So, Council Member, if I could address your first point. Um, totally agree with you in terms of um, how we handle particularly youth offenders of hate crimes. Um, I mentioned in my opening testimony that the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes has been coordinating the interagency committee. Um, and we have all five DA offices are sitting um, on that committee, representatives. And we are now in the process of uh, working in working groups. And one of the specific working groups is exactly what you're talking about in terms of restorative justice. So we're looking at models that have been effective in terms of taking particularly youth offenders, um, teaching them the consequences. What, what, what we have found is that the kids um, who are acting out and doing the swastika incidents in particular know that they're doing something bad, but they don't have a real understanding about the meaning behind a swastika. So uh, I know you mentioned you met with the Brooklyn DA's office. They did a I thought a very good program last summer where they took middle school perpetrators to the Auschwitz exhibit and gave them a real understanding of, of Nazi Germany. Um, those are the kinds of things we're looking at because it, not just to talk about the Holocaust, but we want, we want kids to understand that you know, bullying, name calling can lead to prejudice, can lead to stereotypes, can lead to discrimination can then lead to violence and worse. So it's, we refer to it as a pyramid of hate, and these kinds of programs, we believe, will be very effective. So totally on board with you um, in terms of that. Um, in terms of the numbers, I don't know if you want to address, I know we can, uh, why the numbers were down. Uh, sure, so. I mean, I think, I think I understand your point. I mean, there's, I don't think, it, with the low, with the relatively low uh, difference in hate crimes, I think we're down two versus last year. Uh, that we can say, uh, based on discovery, um, people aren't coming forward. We we seem like we're pretty much in the same place as last year. But I think your point is well taken, and and I think that I think there's been a consensus across the board, both in the state and the mayor and the police commissioner, when. The point is made that reform was in fact necessary, right? There were inherent inequities in the system, um, so that needed to change. However, there could be and there should be fixes that are made to those laws. And to your point on discovery, particularly about protecting victim and witness uh, identifying information or information that may tend to identify victims and witnesses, not to say that it can um, be withheld forever, but uh, the rule of uh, turn it over within 15 days uh, is somewhat prob problematic. Um, there could, in fact, be a process put in that there's a presumptive protection for victim and witness uh, information, um, and then it gets turned over later in the process uh, before trial. So, my question: So, do you, th you believe that? the numbers of hate crimes are higher or could be higher because of the discovery in the bail reform part that people are not coming well, forward. I think w what we can say is that we seem to be roughly in the same place versus last year, uh, but there are certainly changes that ought to be made uh, to the laws to, to fix the laws, them, correct. to bring them into alignment with a more victim-centric approach. Thank you. So I just wanted to mention that um, you know, I have my bill on hate crimes at Comstat, which I met with the NYPD a number of times, and uh, the police commissioner made a commitment that he's going to start discussing um, the hate crimes at Comstat. In addition, uh, also at the community council meetings where the commanding officer will, will also be discussing uh, the hate crimes. So I just want to mention that um, because of the discovery and, and, and the response that you just gave me and also the police commission is um, uh, being vocal on the bail reform entirely, entirely on bail reform. So even if there isn't any hate crimes within a precinct, 
Um, I think that it's important that the commanding officers at every precinct council should continue speaking about hate crimes, although even if there's no reports, but just to say, you know, please um, keep your eyes out, report it. We have community affairs officers in the precinct. Let us know if you see something, say something to us. Yeah, I think the when when you met with the police commissioner and the police commissioner met with the council's Jewish caucus, I think those points were made. I think he was uh, open to that approach. Right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. I have a couple of questions. So, firstly, about reporting. Um, let me digress a little bit. Uh, is there a are we finding that these uh, hate crimes are occurring randomly, demographically, or in particular neighborhoods? Um, and I say that to kind of say, having been born and raised here in New York City, there was neighborhoods that weren't necessarily open to everybody. Do you find yourself visiting somewhere and, and the victim of a hate crime or people coming into specific communities and perpetrating these crimes? So uh, I'll turn it over to NYPD to talk about the statistics, but um, there's been no overall pattern um, that to who's been perpetrating the swastikas, but that being said, we can show that certain neighborhoods have been targeted. So I don't know if you have the breakdown by boroughs or by neighborhoods with uh, you. Sure, I, I could give you uh, the, the borough breakdown and then I'll give you mm -hmm. the NYPD patrol borough breakdown. So as far as the geographic borough breakdown, so New York County uh, had uh, 134 hate crimes uh, actually uh, down fr from last year. That is the uh, second highest reporting county. Uh, number one reporting county is uh, the County of Kings with 186 uh, reported hate crimes last year. That was a 50, that raw number increase of 59. So highest number, highest raw number in uh, the, the uh, County of Kings, highest raw number increase is, is also the County of Kings, uh, followed by Queens with 68, and followed by the Bronx with 28, and Richmond County having 12. As far as the patrol boroughs, uh, Brooklyn South had uh, 100, um, and Brooklyn North having 86, and Manhattan South uh, driving the uh, the number in the in the county with 82, and 52 in Manhattan North, Queens South 23, and 45 in Queens North. Okay, thank you. That that. Not sure if that tells me what, what we asked, but I, I, it, it, it is helpful. It, yes, I mean, again, when, when, you, when you look. If you take a deeper GM, dive as to who was, whether or not we know someone was, who, who committed the crime was from that neighborhood or the crime was committed on a victim who was outside of their neighborhood was kind of where we were getting to. If you have that information, it would be. But in the interest of time, as you search that out, um, Madam Director, yep. um, in terms of reporting, I, I, I know in the statement you talked about how we are in, you're in, your unit is engaging communities and, and visited multiple communities throughout the city, which is great because you can't cultivate a relationship in a moment of crisis. And, and I think when that happens, um, we see kind of uh, coaches of, of, of un under reporting, right, because of what may or may not happen. And so um, ha being a African American Muslim, I, I would submit that perhaps these numbers may not be consistent, right, but it also may be consistent with communities that are culturally conditioned to say, ah, it happens, whether it be that or the LGBTQ community, that it happens. and, and are we getting out into communities you know, and, and just having that initial dialogue that people feel good about engaging authorities, whether it be your unit, police department, or whatever, saying that these unsafe conditions might occur so that we can get to a preventive space? Right. So, Councilman, those, those conversations are, I believe, critically important. 
Um, obviously, we're starting in Brooklyn because we're still a bit in that reactive mode. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen um, again and again is that there's a real hunger among New Yorkers to want to engage in these difficult conversations. Um, and so to the extent that we can foster those, um, you know, I, I think it will have long-term positive impact for all New Yorkers. Okay. So thank you for that input. And as my colleagues all mentioned that, that obviously this council here, whatever we can do to be supportive, we're, we're, we're gonna do that. Um, Thank you. And then, uh, Chief, I, I, I heard of, uh, and as, as sort of social media went viral and I happened to hear these two young, two young men being interviewed on the radio who was recently uh, harassed and allegedly assaulted on, on a subway, and they were uh, African-American, and, 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 and maybe not that it matter, LGBTQ as well, and, and um, by a, a white woman. And um, clearly, she was being, they were being harassed, but also, you know, they were touched and other things happened, but they walked into a precinct and they was essentially told to man up. And that she was, eh, we kind of know her, She's a little off of, you know, she's, she's not all there. Um, not a big deal. Um, for a lot of reasons, that's probably not the way it should be handled. And I'm not sure if it was handled that way. This is by virtue of their story. Um, but if it is, what confidence do we have moving forward that when those incidents take place, that people get comfortable doing that? And are we sending a message that these young men should respond? in a different kind of way. Are you familiar with that? I, I am not familiar with, with that specific incident. Um, I, I, I will tell you that it is the policy of the New York City Police, Dep uh, Police Department to take uh, all complaint reports, uh, whatever it is. Um, so I, I will certainly get you the information sure. because I, I'm, I'm curious to know whether or not it was investigated or taken or, or what happened specifically in that, that incident because, uh, as I said, I, I saw it on social media, I saw the tweets, and, 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 uh, and uh, eventually they were on uh, multiple radio programs and telling their story. So obviously it's, it's something that, that hit a nerve in, in, in those communities that um, if you go, uh, the authorities are going to treat this differently, as, and so we want to make sure that services get delivered equitably, even in terms of that. And then finally, um, of these hate crimes thus far this year, has any of them been attributed to someone who was out on bail, or should have been out on bail? Um. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Out on someone who oh. was out on bail, uh, bail on bail, bail, or someone who was home because of bail reform. Okay, I, I, as far as bail reform, you know, rearrests, bail eligible felonies. I, I don't have it broken down to who was arrested for a bail eligible felony that fits uh, this criteria. This, this criteria. Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that important question because when you know, generalities are thrown out. We like data, and data helps to educate us um, specifically on what things we can do better. And obviously, we at the council have not passed the state reforms. Um, but one thing I just want to caution everybody on is that data is very important in helping us to determine which ways, even if there is a reason to reform bail. So thank you for that question, Councilmember Miller. All righty, thank you all for coming out. Thank, thank you. you, thank you for your work. Look forward thank you, to Thank you. All righty, uh, we're gonna hear from Lisa Schreiberstorff from the Executive Director from Brooklyn Defender Services, David Katz, UJO of Williamsburg, Saeed, I'm messing this up, Muslim Community Network, Reem Ramadan, New York City Anti-Violence Project, and Ashin, Ash, Ashin Hot, Gomez, El Puente.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I only have one, though. No. This one? This one. All right, let me just go through this. Everybody's up. Yeah. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm Lisa Schreibersdorf. I'm the Executive Director of Brooklyn Defender Services. <clears throat> Um, towards the end of the prior testimonies, we got to the point where we were talking about the criminal justice reforms, and I really came here today to talk a little bit about that, um, both as the lawyer for Tiffany Harris, uh, the person who's been in the press quite a bit around the issue of um, hate crimes, and also as a representative of thousands of people who get arrested in Brooklyn every year, most of whom are black or otherwise people of color. Um, primarily what I really want to say is, of course I think it's important that we are focusing on the issue of hateful acts that are being perpetrated. I myself am a Jewish person, and of course it's deeply troubling to me to see a rise in anti-Semitism. My family are Holocaust survivors, so I, in no way am I trying to poo-poo all of this, uh, many discussions that we're having, very real and very serious conversations we're having about anti-Semitism. But I want us to also decouple that conversation from a lot of what I think is very inflammatory remarks that are sometimes made about things that happen in the community. And I appreciated the questions about what is really a hate crime, how is that being determined, and who is that against? And um, I would really welcome you to, write, to read this testimony, actually, because it's one of testimonies that I feel really strongly about. I've written a lot of testimonies in my years. Um, but Tiffany Harris, in whose name a lot of this conversation is happening, is a person, you know, I can't really talk about the privileged information, but publicly everybody knows, she's a person with a serious mental illness who has been in the hospital since January 1st, in, in a mental hospital. and. Um, the, asser the assertion that she, wa she was out of jail on a prior case when she got arrested on a case where she inflicted, I, I don't want to characterize it, but she did an act that was involved touching others. I'm not minimizing it. Um, who were Jewish, but she's also been arrested for the same act, which in my opinion comes, derives from her mental illness for many people who are not Jewish. And I think determining what is actually a hate crime versus what is not, especially when there are people who have mental illness and who act out of thoughts that are hard to understand. Um, I think it's really important that we do that. And I feel like I need to stand up on behalf of our, my client, of our client in my office, because her, the, what happened with her is being used as an example of why the bail laws are somehow impacting um, you know, hate crime, which it just isn't. It's just not a thing that's happening. And my concern with the legislation before this body is that it was just really shocking to me when, when the police were going through some of the statistics and they were talking about hate crimes against black people and none of them were property crimes. So that means they've, they do not identify one crime in the city of New York where the N-word was scrawled on a uh, you know, subway. In other words, that's just not even part of this dialogue. And I would say that um, we should be doing a lot better job of separating what's a crime versus what is really disgusting but is not a crime. And all this talk of what's a crime is really de-emphasizing the importance of not having police engaging in this type of growth that we're trying to do in the city, which is very important, which is trying to impact, I think, a problem that we have, but cannot be impacted by more and more police interactions. The problem with this legislation and with, and look, I thought that the people who spoke were very heartfelt, but as it is, there's two, there's, huge amounts of communities that will not interact with the police, who themselves are victims, very, very much so, of hate crimes all the time. I use the transgender community as one very pressing example, especially transgender people of color, who themselves are targeted by police for abuse. There are people who have been in jail who themselves feel like victims 
of racism by law enforcement and have been if you look at the statistics in jail. These are not people that are coming forward to report what happened to them as hate crimes. And because of that, the emphasis now is on anti-Semitism, which, as I said, as a Jewish person, I am very happy that we're, we're focused on this. But it is also missing some of the point, and it is using what I believe is some form of racism against people of color who might or might commit acts that might involve Jewish people as if the problem was that, and actually driving a wedge between the Jewish community and the black community, particularly in Crown Heights, in a place that has a long history of racial divisiveness. And I just really wanted to put that out there. I feel very troubled by the fact that the number of crimes against black people is so low, as defined as a hate crime, and I think we need to do a lot of work now identifying what's a crime versus what is an act of hatred and separating and segregating from the police the responsibility for solving what is a very, very, very serious social problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished council members. My name is David Katz. I'm the associate director of the United Jewish Organizations of Williamsburg. I'm here on behalf of our executive director, Rabbi David Niederman, who wanted to join but had a prior commitment um, and I'm happy to deliver his support in, uh, in, for the wonderful Office of the Prevention of Hate Crimes and its leader, uh, Deborah Lauder, that was created by this body. Williamsburg has been one of the neighborhoods in New York City hardest hit by this vicious spate of anti-Semitic hate crimes to plague our area in recent years. Moshe Deitch, a resident of Williamsburg and a volunteer of, of ours at the UJO, was brutally murdered at the Jersey City Kosher supermarket in December. But well before Jersey, the Jersey City shooting, and the machete attack in Muncie, Williamsburg, Crown Heights, and other orthodox areas in New York City have been under siege with anti-Semitic assaults, vandalism, and harassment of orthodox Jewish residents whose only crime is wearing their faith on their sleeve. In July, Tablet Magazine released a map of anti-Semitic incidents in New York City, and they tracked down, but they were able to track down since 2015 um, all the attacks in, in New York City, and the results are disturbing and show how pervasive the problem is and uh, has been and how difficult it's going to be to tackle it going forward. Uh, the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes is not here to replace law enforcement, nor should it be. Law enforcement, law enforcement is the most critical piece to protect communities from hate crimes and to respond to those crimes in the event of an attack. We also have to understand that the battle against hate crimes should be multifaceted, necessitating an all-hands-on-deck approach. It's important for all hands to come together, and that needs all segments of the local community where these attacks are happening to come together. Their reach is deep in the community, and they're the ones who have the most vested in keeping their communities and homes safe and peaceful, and that's why the Neighborhood Safety Coalition will be an important vehicle to accomplish that. Speaking to kids in public schools in areas where these attacks are happening is a must. Many times we see young kids are the ones perpetrating these attacks, and this behavior is being learned somewhere, and it needs to be unlearned. In Williamsburg, we have met with the District 14 Superintendent Alicia Winicky a number of times uh, with Deborah and with the Office of the Prevention of Hate Crimes. We have spoken with student leadership to hear from them why these uh, attacks are happening and what can be done to prevent that kind of behavior. We have spoken with principals, parents, to reach out to community youth and learn from them and try to build bridges to stop, uh, put a stop to the hate. We thank the City Council again for the creation of this office and appreciate the Council's leadership on this issue and the work you're all doing to put a stop to the spread of hate crimes in the city. Thanks. Thank you. Salaam alaikum, peace, and good afternoon, Chair Richards and the Committee on Public Safety, and thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Reem Ramadan, and I'm the lead organizer at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. AVP envisions a world in which all lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, H and HIV affected people are safe, respected, and live free from violence. Our mission is to empower LGBTQ and HIV affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing and education and support survivors through counseling and advocacy. AVP is the only LGBTQ-specific victim services agency in New York City and the largest organization in the country dedicated exclusively to working with LGBTQ and HIV-affected survivors of all forms of violence. As a member of the NYC Against Hate Coalition, which last year proposed and advocated for the hate crimes 
prevention initiative. We work with partners and allies cross identity and citywide with the collective goal of preventing hate violence. The Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes shares a similar goal, a, a similar goal and also works with us to strive to achieve it. With re respect to Council Member Traeger's intro 1847, while we do think it is important to respond to acts of hate violence in the immediate, we don't think this office is the place to call on to take that responsibility. The office is meant to focus on hate violence prevention and not crisis response. Community organizations are best positioned and most trusted to notify impacted communities about hate violence incidents and should be funded to do this work, which also includes data collection. Intro 1847 references violent hate crime as the standard for this response work and we are curious about how this is defined. At AVP, we use the phrase hate violence, a, pro a broader definition that includes anti-LGBTQ bias incidents that may not qualify as hate, as hate crimes but are harmful to individuals and the community at large. Crisis response is valuable in ensuring immediate safety and expressing solidarity with communities that have been harmed. It does not address the symptoms and real problems of hate violence. New York City must support prevention that addresses the systemic violence that our communities face and to address hate crimes before they even happen. And the Office of Prevention of Hate Crimes is part of that strategy and, and needs to be able to focus on that work with the staff that they have. At AVP, we value work that takes us towards prevention. While we do rapid response work around hate violence, including providing support to survivors and working with communities to build safety in the aftermath of violence, we also do the long-term work with partners and members to ensure hate violence doesn't happen in the first place. And we do this by investment in our communities, working across identities, political education and de-escalation tools, and unlearning and redefining what safety means to communities vulnerable to hate violence. What we know right now from members is that government should trust our experience as vulnerable communities exposed to hate violence to help shape what we think response to, to such acts should look like. And they should look to invest in community-based resources that uphold values embedded in restorative justice and community safety. And AVP is at the ready to continue our work with the council and city agencies to support these efforts. And thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, my name is Saab Keshki and I deliver this testimony on behalf of the Muslim Community Network, a civil society based nonprofit organization that advocates for and works with the city's diverse Muslim population. Our work includes civic advocacy such as work on the Eid holiday campaign and introducing halal slash kosher food in NYC public schools, as well as working with youth in Islamic schools doing diversity education workshops with the DOE and private institutions as well as interfaith work with other religious groups. We are a partner organization with the NYC Office of Hate Crimes Prevention to gather data on hate crimes being experienced by the Muslim community. Results from this survey will be used to create better prevention and enforcement policies, as well as creating public awareness about the actual number of hate crimes, which is significantly underreported. The reality of hate crimes and experience of hate by the Muslim community is not being reflected in data, policy making, or public perception. The Muslim community has not been reporting the realities on ground due to factors root rooted in alienation and fear. This would include an uneasy relationship with law enforcement, punitive in immigration policies, lack of education and language competency, lack of information in the process and outcomes when reporting a hate crime, as well as cultural barriers due to law enforcement playing a negative role in the majority of countries from where the Muslim community originates. There are two large underlying factors that are driving the external perception of Muslims. Number one, federal, state, and local rhetoric. From the White House to Pete King, from anti-Muslim rallies to Fox News, the rhetoric against Muslims has been both harsh and incendiary, blurring the lines for both the public and government agencies as far as differentiating between ordinary Muslims and religious extremists who are indeed a clear, present, and permanent danger. This in turn has made the Muslim community fearful of interacting with government agencies because while the political leadership of NYC makes, may speak favorably of Muslims, the impact that the top, toxic rhetoric has had on people actually working in government and law enforcement has been felt by many within the community. 
This should not at all be taken as a sweeping condemnation of law enforcement or government employees, but just an acknowledgement that people who already had a biased disposition may feel emboldened due to anti-Muslim rhetoric, and those who are neutral may feel swayed towards negativity. The second would be the public perceptions towards Muslims has also sharpened thanks to political rhetoric, and this in turn has put the Muslim community into a siege mentality of sorts. In a situation where it is hard to tell ally from oppressor, com communities tend to recede into themselves. This would also make them hesitant to participate in any kind of activity such as reporting a hate crime because they feel detached from both the government and other communities, and this creates a perception of futility in trying to receive justice. There are also several other factors at play, such as the images of Muslims that are projected from the media, as well as the types of literature and training pro programs that actually reinforce bias. Our response, MCN is working to give Muslim victims of hate crimes a voice by strengthening the reporting of data and also tackling the issue of underreporting through creating strong and transparent relationships with mosques, community groups, and notable individuals within the mo Muslim community. <laughs> this is a process that is far more complex than it appears, as conducting a hate crime survey requires a safe environment, as well as support from local Muslim institutions within the neighborhood in question. There are also multiple languages spoken within the Muslim community, and to create a culturally appropriate survey for each linguistic group is itself quite challenging. I am pleased to report that progress is rapidly being made in regards to connecting with the mosques and organizations who will assist in facilitating our work, there's also a clear desire being displayed by the community to relay their experiences once they feel comfortable with the process and the manner in which the survey is conducted. It is also important to note that MCN is the only organization working specifically on the Muslim hate crime issue surveys with the Office of Hate Crime Prevention. With all of this work, we continue to need city investment and funding to help us grow and expand on our initiatives so as to build a society that respects all of its diverse communities. If anyone from the esteemed council or audience wishes to discuss this further, in your case, you have my card and my information there. And for everyone else, please feel free to contact me at Saad, S-A-A-D, at mcnny.org. Please also look at our website at www.mcnny.org. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just quickly, how has your experience been working with the Office to Prevent Hate Crimes? Uh, Hassan and, Hare uh, has been incredibly supportive. Oh, you got a plug already, huh? Okay. Uh, I mean, definitely so. I have to say he's been a great ally and very open. Mm -hmm. And there's no, well, I'm not a, obviously he's a very busy person, but the, he always gets back to me. As and, soon as possible. Okay, yeah. Good. And then El Puente, are you familiar with the office? Has there been outreach to organizations like that? I'm mean, sorry, your anti-violence project, sorry. Yes, no? Yes. Yes. El Puente as well? Is it ABP? Is the question? Oh, they all, why did I have El Puente? <laughs> El Puente was the last no. name. Yeah. Oh. oh. Okay, well, I'll just oh, get off that. <laughs> oh. oh, maybe they didn't come. Oh, they didn't come up. Okay, got you. All right, he for these organizations. Okay, got it. Um... In UJO, uh, yes. I'm assuming in Williamsburg, there's obviously been a lot of challenges. Um, what has the, have you experienced working with the NYPD, these neighborhood organizations that they say they're pulling together? What has that experience been like? The, uh, the Neighborhood Safety Coalition? Yes, that, yes. That, that just started, I think, last week. They had their initial meeting. Um, okay. So it's going to be a process to work with all the community groups uh, over there. We look forward to, we're a part of it. Um, and we look forward to talking to our neighbors and, and seeing what we could do to strengthen, um, you know, the relationships on the ground. Okay, awesome. All righty. All right, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. All righty, we're on to our last person, I believe. Anybody from El Puente here as well? Oh, okay, you are here. I called you before. Okay. All right, okay, no problem. We could have brought a chair up. But we'll have Ms. Gomez and we'll have Bruce Jacobs. Coalition of the Rockaways. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Just fill out a slip. You want to testify? So you're going to fill out a slip, and then you are more than welcome. Good afternoon. I want to thank the members of the Committee for Public Safety, as well as all the other city, mem city council members here today for the leadership and for allowing me to speak on this issue today. 
My name is Asenet Gomez, Deputy Director for Programming at El Puente, and I'm here on behalf of our Executive Director, Francis Lucerna, as well as the youth leaders and their families across the six after-school leadership centers, the MS-50, El Puente Community School, the El Puente Academy for Peace and Justice, as well as the community members we serve through the El Puente North Brooklyn Greenlight District Initiative and our community arts programs. We are here in support of the work of the Office for Prevention of Hate Crimes and the Williamsburg Neighborhood Safety Coalition that this office has launched. Even if we did not have the honor to be one of the coalition's initial members, we will be one of its dedicated supporters, investing in promoting a culture of loss, love, compassion, and respect. El Puente has fought for human rights, peace, and justice in North Brooklyn for nearly 40 years. We can attest that for decades, Williamsburg's diverse communities have come together in times of struggle, and in this critical moment, we must do it again. The recent violent attacks, especially those on our Jewish sisters and brothers, have deeply shaken our neighborhood and reminds us we must take concerted efforts to come together and take action as one united community against hate. That these incidents are part of a wider patterns of hate and violence against people of other faith traditions, against immigrants, against our LGBTQ neighbors and others, signals to us that we cannot do it alone. We need the support and resources of the city to amplify our efforts and empower us with information so that we can help lift our whole borough and our city. El Puente, as our name in Spanish suggests, is committed to building bridges with our neighborhood partners on the Neighborhood Safety Coalition and the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes to inspire unity and understanding that will nurture a community of respect for all. We look forward to City Council's leadership and support in helping us do just that. Thank you so much. Testimony. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Antonine Pierre and I'm the Deputy Director of the Brooklyn Movement Center. And uh, good afternoon, Chairman Richards, members of the Public Safety Committee, and thank you to the Mayor's Office of Prevention of Hate Crimes for the invitation to testify today. The Brooklyn Movement Center is a black-led, membership-based organization of primarily low to moderate income Central Brooklyn residents. We build power and pursue self-determination in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights by nurturing lo local leadership, waging campaigns, and winning concrete improvements in people's lives. BMC received funding from the council last fiscal year to do hate violence prevention work in Central Brooklyn, which we're centering around a type of black intra-community violence, attacks on black trans women. In June 2019, the American Medical Association named fatal violence against trans women as an epidemic, citing also the disproportionate killing of black trans women. Of the at least 26 trans or gender nonconforming people violently killed in, in the United States last year, the Human Rights Commission reports 18 were black, including Yahira Nesby, a 33-year-old woman shot in Brownsville, Brooklyn, on December 19, 2019. Yahira performs sex work and her suspected killer is a black cisgendered man who was possibly a client. As we work to address hate violence in hindsight, I urge this committee to plan proactively around the safety of black trans women. The health the healthcare access afforded trans people in New York City relative to much of the country attracts them to move here, but the city fails trans people as a whole on ensuring safety through legal employment and affordable housing. Too often, black trans women pushed into sex work suffer violence at the hands of cisgendered men whose masculinity is constructed in opposition to femininity, queerness, and trans identities. In their minds, the violence they dole out to people who are feminine, queer, and trans affirms their dominance and by proxy their maleness. This spring, BMC will host several conversations with cisgendered men in central Brooklyn about transforming their own masculinity. How can black men leave behind the dangerous expectations of masculinity that justify unspeakable acts of violence? How should they safely intervene in instances of violence against black trans women? 
There's nothing simple or straightforward about these questions or their answers. Preventing all forms of hate violence starts with transforming the self, then extending that transformation into the broader community. Preventing the murder of another Yahira Nesby will be the product of tearful conversations, difficult realizations, and a continued commitment to a long-term healing process. We hold undoing trauma as a goal of a community healing process, equally important to undoing hate. This is why we cannot advocate for the NYPD to be a partner in responding to hate violence as the traumas black men and trans women and black trans women have suffered from the NYPD complicate and even impede a process of community healing. Whether or not members of this committee agree with the data showing NYPD interactions are traumatizing to New Yorkers, validating this widely held perspective is the first step in addressing the nuance of how we experience hate violence. In addressing harms and trauma, policing cannot be both the problem and the solution. More specifically in regards to intro 1847, while the Office of Prevention of Hate Crimes is more than equipped to notify elected officials of hate violence incidents within 24 hours, we have concerned about the office's ability to mount a community-centered rapid response that does not lead with criminalization of community members. We have learned that effective community-centered response requires months and sometimes years of relationship building, scenario planning, and leadership development to execute in times of crisis. Additionally, in studying the effectiveness of neighborhood safety plans, we ask that safety plan recommendations prioritize transformative justice and healing solutions over relying on the carceral state. We also request that data from community organiza organizations be included as the city works to define communities, quote unquote, vulnerable to hate violence. As hate violence is often underreported due to fraught community relationships with law enforcement, we are concerned that the most vulnerable communities will be overlooked in their time of need. In closing, I would like to thank Cricket Nimmons, a transgender rights advocate and friend of Yahira Nesby's, with whom I co consulted for this testimony. Making this city safer for black trans women ultimately means ensuring the safety of all New Yorkers who are subject to transphobia, misogyny, racism, and all the intersections of these oppressions they experience. We do this work with, not for, black trans women, intentionally promoting their leadership, voices, and experiences in the work. The reorganizing of whose perspective is most prominent centers our goals to affirm their inherent value in a world organized to separate them from their humanity. Thank you. Thank you, and we're gonna ask, uh, to, to, do we copy her written testimony as well? We can get a copy. I, yeah, I have okay. copies. Okay, great, thank you. Bruce Jacobs. Uh, good afternoon. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways and Southeast Queens and Medical and Religious Freedom, U.S. Navy veteran, representative of the Redfern Housing. I'm all for this hate crime bill, except for one thing. I don't like the idea that everybody, it seems to be like a nonprofit or whatever, pushing the idea of hate crimes. What about the regular, everybody's going to say to get more police in their neighborhood. They're going to say everything was a hate crime. Yes, we do need the police to check the situation. In my neighborhood, Southeast Queens and Far Rockaway, with there's no bail and the idea the court should be the ones pushing the cases, not the door of letting out criminals in the streets without programs, without anything to help them. Yes, we do need the police. We need the police more than organizations and vigilantes to take care of it. The police are the qualified people. We, I understand working with the police, but to say that the police, to keep them away from somebody that's going to ruin somebody's life, and say it was a hate crime when it might have been a regular crime? That's a question. In my neighborhood, since the no bail, there's people hanging out in the streets, doing whatever they want. They have this idea, they say, that de Blasio's hampering them. I've had discussions with de Blasio where de Blasio said that's not true. The police in my neighborhood claim that they can't stop anybody. So you're gonna put all kind of money into hate crime Pacific the problem with that is where are the resources for the neighborhood that they're not going to get? Because if you're spending all this money emphasizing on certain things, I went to Lubavitch Yeshiva, so I know Brooklyn, the political uh, aspect of it. 
And of course, I want protection for the people and all different people, but I also want protection for our neighborhoods where we can't, a law-abiding citizen, walk up the street. I don't want a vigilante or nonprofit telling me what to do. I'd rather have law and order in our neighborhoods. The thought that there is right now no law and order in the streets. That's ridiculous. Look at all statistics. That's what everybody's asking for, statistics. Look what happened in, South, in, in Jamaica the other day. Look what happened in Springfield Garden two weeks ago. Look what happens every day when you walk out to the street, the young kid who has to be influenced because nobody could say anything about arresting these people. The people that get suffered the most in these neighborhoods is the people of color. Because a guy like me walks to my corner store, I don't have a problem. But guess what? A young kid going to the store for his grandmother or his mother or family and being harassed by feeling sorry for some guys because the court, I agree with, the, you know, with this council, you want to try to help people. The problem with this helping people is not everybody is a gang member. You know, not yeah, everybody. I wrap up. They need to think. And, you know, I appreciate the work that you do trying, but we need our safety in our streets. And, like, I'm looking for you, for you council people, to bring us back this safety. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the organizations, uh, just before we wrap up, um, uh, I just had one question. Um, so uh, just on the 24-hour no notification, because that's what this bill does, and, and partly one of the reasons I would say this is important is because sometimes we're left in the dark, um, even as elected officials on incidents that may occur. Um, so I just wanted to get your input on, on that a little bit, um, because we're not necessarily taking much more of a heavier law enforcement um, solution here. We're pushing for better notification so that we can have more of a localized understanding um, and approach to many of the incidents um, that do occur that may be underreported or not reported at all in local communities. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as stated in our testimony, we definitely agree and feel that the office is more than equipped to do notifications of elected officials. Some of our concerns are actually with, uh, some of our concerns are that the bill language shows a certain perspective on policing and hate violence that we don't agree with. So while we're clear that that's not the issue that's being discussed today, we want it to be heard and known that we're looking for more transformative justice solutions to dealing with hate violence. I completely agree. And what I want to say is in terms of the 24-hour response that um, you know, I think what's lacking is what support systems are being offered to the victims, right? So yes, it is to report it to you know, whoever can support and be involved, including the council members. But what support systems are being offered to the people that are actually being impacted. I think there should be some language about that uh, because there was not a whole lot of response about how are they connected uh, and who's responsible for connecting them to those resources. All right, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, that was helpful, thank you. All right, with that being said, I wanna thank everyone for coming out to this public hearing. I wanna thank, um, Hold on, my committee staff, Dan Uadis, uh, Casey Addison, Nevin Singh, and also congratulate Tiffany Easton on her first hearing. And with that being said, uh, we got a lot of work to do to make sure that tolerance is more than a slogan in New York City, but the solution all lies with each and every one of us every day. So thank you for coming out. <laughs>